in southern Manitoba that has gone from renown to infamy to renown once more. Examining its history and making connections to the larger history of land and water management throughout southern Manitoba provides a window on evolving ideas of nature and progress on the Canadian prairies and the North American Great Plains. I'm Lauren Wheeler, PhD student in history at the University of Alberta, and in this conversation, Shannon Sundin Bauer and I delve into the history of Manitoba's wet prairie. Shannon is a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of History and Classics at the University of Alberta. She has recently published Wet Prairie, People, Land and Water in Agricultural Manitoba in UBC Press's Nature, History, Society series. Let's start with an image of a remarkable landscape just a few kilometers northwest of Manitoba's capital city of Winnipeg. In this image at least, the landscape appears to be relatively undisturbed, an area in which non-human nature continues to flourish. But of course, appearances can be deceiving, or at least they can fail to tell the whole story. An Okamic Marsh, the wetland we are looking at here, has an interesting story to tell. So what is the story of Okamic Marsh? Rather than undisturbed nature, the story is one of successive attempts to remake the landscape. The story starts well over a century ago. Prior to settlement by European newcomers, and even in the early days of colonization, wet areas were valued for the plants that grew there and the waterfowl they attracted. In fact, for early settlers at Red River Settlement, on the site of what is now the city of Winnipeg, the hay that grew in wet areas was an indispensable feed for domesticated animals. At that early point, the area that is today Oak Hammock Marsh was an extensive wetland known as St. Andrew's Bog. It sounds like the bog was a valued resource in the early days. Indeed. But this would change before long. By the late 19th century, surface water was inhibiting agricultural development in what was becoming a densely settled region. The population in Manitoba, and indeed across the Canadian prairies, was increasing, in part because of Canadian federal government efforts to encourage settlement. Those who came wanted dry farms. Rather than valuable resources in their own right, wet areas began to seem like submerged land. What was it like for settlers who lived in areas they perceived to be too wet? Well, it was difficult in many ways. Not only could they not achieve the productive farms they had hoped to establish, but also the wet landscape made daily life quite challenging. For instance, in May 1896, settler G.S. Howard wrote to the Manitoba Minister of Public Works on behalf of his neighbours. The letter and accompanying petition provide a sense of what it was like to live in a frequently inundated area. It is injurious to our health to go about from day to day wet-footed. Anywhere we want to go, we have to walk through water to get there. Our children cannot go to school half the time they should go, and they are losing their education in consequence. Since settlers were unable to grow crops, Howard warned that starvation was a real risk for many in the area. Letters such as Howard's make it clear that good surface drainage was necessary to bridge the gulf between the agricultural aspirations of newcomers and the environmental realities of southern Manitoba. In fact, as Howard put it, if the government wants settlers to come to Manitoba, they ought to make the place fit for them to live in. And so St. Andrew's Bog was one of the areas targeted for drainage. How was Manitoba drained? The logistics of draining Manitoba were relatively simple. A substantial amount of work was done by horse and plow, the sorts of tools a farmer would have had on the farm. Large ditch digging machines were also employed. In St. Andrew's Bog, for instance, two dredges were built on location. They started digging at the high end of one of the major drains and floated downstream in their own ditch as they worked toward the outlet. The massive, steam-powered dredges were slow, but they completed a significant amount of excavation in early 20th century Manitoba. Moreover, these imposing machines lent a sense of grandeur to the enterprise, confirming the association between drainage and progress. Who paid for all this? Like the governments of other areas faced with similar needs to drain, the province of Manitoba established a system of drainage districts. Under the Drainage Districts Act of 1895, the provincial government would front the money for large-scale drainage, with residents of the drainage district repaying the loan over a period of decades. The expectation was that the improved agricultural productivity of drained land would more than compensate for the expense of construction. If the physical work of draining was simple, paying for it was far more complicated. 
This becomes apparent if we focus in on St. Andrew's Bog. In 1896, the bog became part of the first drainage district established in Western Canada. The original wetland of 470 square kilometres was reduced to less than one square kilometre. The province owned a significant quantity of lands within St. Andrew's Bog. Since Crown lands were not subject to taxation, the cost of draining the Crown lands within drainage district number one was divided among the private owners of the district. This inflated the cost to the landowner. But beyond the high price, landowners were also upset with the apparent failure of drainage efforts. The province could not have picked a worse place for the first drainage district. St. Andrew's Bog was fed by a significant number of underground springs. Flooding in this region was not simply a question of runoff pooling in low areas. The springs meant that, regardless of alterations to drainage patterns and local topography, the area remained swampy. The province knew about these springs. Indeed, an 1882 provincial report referred to them as subterranean rivers. But in this area, as throughout the other drainage districts created in the province of Manitoba, environmental realism was dismissed in the face of agricultural ambition. When did people start to change their approach to the area? Well, as it became clear that drainage would not succeed in St. Andrew's Bog, other visions for the area began to emerge. Ducks Unlimited Canada, the Canadian arm of the American agency founded to promote the protection of waterfowl breeding habitat, became interested in restoring a part of St. Andrew's Bog as early as the 1930s. What was called the Okamic Project was planned, but not completed. Between 1940 and 1945, the area was used as a practice bombing range as part of the Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Hundreds of smoke bombs were dropped on painted targets set up in what had once been valuable wetland habitat. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, the provincial government acquired over 3,000 hectares of land from local landowners with financial help from the federal government. In 1972, with the assistance of Ducks Unlimited Canada, Manitoba Conservation began restoring a small portion of the original marsh. Construction was completed in the spring of 1973, and the area, about 36 square kilometers, was officially designated the Oak Hammock Marsh Wildlife Management Area. In 1984, Oak Hammock Marsh was recognized as a wetland of international importance. Over the years, various public and private agencies worked to expand the protected area. All of this is remarkable, but it should be remembered that the 36 square kilometers of protected area represent but a fraction of the 470 square kilometers that were originally wetland in the area. So the area was becoming a bit of an attraction by this time. Indeed. By the mid-1980s, it was clear that Oak Hammock Marsh had tremendous potential for education and tourism. But the facilities were inadequate for the roughly 80,000 people who would visit the site each year. To meet this demand, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Manitoba Natural Resources, and the Government of Canada decided to join forces to build a substantial visitor centre. The process of constructing this centre and the building itself is suggestive of the new approach to the area's environment. Before proceeding with construction, extensive environmental studies and monitoring programs were carried out to prevent or minimize disturbances to wildlife species. When construction finally began in 1991, much of the work was done in winter, with particularly bothersome stages put on hold during the spring and fall migration seasons, during which waterfowl made extensive use of the marsh. The building itself was designed to blend in with the landscape as much as possible. Local limestone was used on the building's face, and an award-winning green roof was constructed to ensure ducks and geese saw mainly indigenous vegetation as they approached from the air. The entire area was landscaped with native grasses, shrubs, trees, and flowers. Construction was completed in 1992, and the building now features offices for Ducks Unlimited Canada and Manitoba Conservation, as well as the Oak Hammock Marsh Interpretive Centre. The building provided not only a resource for people visiting and working in the area, but also a reflection of how much opinions about the value of wet landscape had evolved. Decades earlier, much money and effort had been expended in an effort to do away with St. Andrew's Bog. Now, people were striving to minimize evidence of the human footprint in the area. So has St. Andrew's Bog been restored? Excellent question. Okamic Marsh is home to 25 species of mammals, 
300 species of birds, numerous amphibians, reptiles and fish, and countless invertebrates. During migration season, the number of waterfowl using the marsh can exceed 400,000 daily. But to say that the landscape in the marsh has been conserved or preserved or protected would be disingenuous. In reality, the wet landscape is profoundly different from how it was in the past. The best evidence of this is perhaps the intensively managed character of the marsh itself. Oak Hammock Marsh has a number of control structures at its inlets and outlet. These serve to regulate the flow of water. The marsh is divided into four impoundments with water control capabilities built into each major cell. Individual impoundments can be drawn down or reflooded to achieve management objectives. This is an intensively managed wet landscape, one that reflects evolving human designs on the area. Even in attempts to restore something resembling a prior nature, the human footprint remains. Not even a green roof can change that. But is that necessarily negative? Human beings flying over Oak Hammock Marsh might catch a glimpse of two striking ponds. Shaped like a duck and a goose, these ponds were created as burrow pits while dikes and access roads were being built during marsh restoration efforts. The duck-shaped pond even has an island representing the bird's eye. What do people think on seeing these ponds? Do they represent an appropriate tribute to waterfowl? Are they simply evidence of human whimsy? Or are they further evidence of the human drive to transform the natural world? Whatever humans may see, we can be sure that ducks find in these ponds something entirely different. A place in which to rest and to eat and perhaps to breed. A place that is both similar to and different from the St. Andrew's Bog in which their predecessors may have stopped over a century ago. Thank you for watching and for more on the history of water management on the prairies, please pick up Shannon Sundin Bower's Wet Prairie, People, Land and Water in Agricultural Manitoba. Thank you.